Let's now move on to the aerospace industry, the DO-178B and DO-178C. So the DO-178B, title for this is Software Considerations. So this is purely software. Previously we've looked at hardware and production aspects. But this is just software in airborne systems. This was originally published in 1992. This is now 20 years ago now. There was an errata published in 1999 to correct some issues. This standard, well, guidelines, recommendations, really say that software will perform reliably in airborne environments. And this is the worldwide avionics software guidelines to which all software which will be used in an airborne system is required to comply. And this, these recommendations, they use the DAL levels, which are used throughout the aerospace industry, design assurance levels, and I'm going to say E to A to make it easy to compare between the ASILs 1 to 4 and the ASILs A to D. So we have the lowest design assurance level as E, which has no impact on safety and in fact isn't required for you to comply with the DO178B if you deem that your software is for design assurance level E. But A is the, the most risk involved software. The software that would be shown as the highest risk to human safety. If we look at the DO178C, which has been published in December 2011 and was available to view early 2012, early this year. Same title, Software Considerations, Airborne Systems and Equipment Certification. In DO 178B, more objectives for the top three software levels have been given. The language is a little bit clearer. One of the criticisms of DO 178C is that it was so flexible and it was so difficult to interpret that people could interpret it in so many ways. So they've tried to address this in DO 178C and in so doing they've published some additional supplements to address some of the issues that have brought the DO 178C up to the current software methodologies. So they've included a software tool qualification. They've also included a supplement for model-based development and object-oriented software as those methods weren't really around in 1992. But now in 2011, they're much more widely used. In a similar way to the IEC 61508 and the ISO 26262, the DO178B and DO178C have these compliance tables and they're formatted slightly differently, but again numbered 1 through 7 and we have the DAL levels at the top, A through D, where again D is the lowest risk level and A is the highest risk level. And here, the DO178B introduces this concept of independence, where, let's just look at a couple in particular. So we'll look at the, the source code conforming to standards, and the source code being accurate and consistent. So this is something that static analysis tools would be able to help you with. <clears throat> the, the open circle is that the objective should be satisfied, and the closed, fully filled in circle is that it should be satisfied with independence. But what is this independence? Well, it can be just somebody else within the software development team. So the person who wrote the code should not be the person who tests the code. Or it can be somewhere outside of the development team. And it could be even somebody outside of the company. And of course, the further away they are from the original developer, the more you should be able to trust that they've done an objective analysis. We also have this concept of these control category levels. So we have two control category levels where software configuration management control. So within the DO178B, they give 13 process objectives for the control category one, which requires all of the 13 objectives. But the control category two only requires a minimum of six objectives. So these for each of these um, DAL levels A through C, you'll see that these entries, source code is accurate and consistent, only needs to conform to the data satisfies the objectives of CC2. These process objectives, they include things like traceability, 
and protection against unauthorised changes. So what about the tool qualification for DO178B? Well, a, ver a verification tool has to show that the requirements are clear and unambiguous. Each requirement must have test cases to prove that the tool meets that requirement. And this can be done with a black box testing of verification tools. So basically, verification tools have to do what they say they do. And this is a way of qualifying that. But how can you do this? Well, you can choose a tool and create these yourself. So write the requirement of each of the diagnostic message that would be produced with a static analysis tool and then write test cases to show that it does indeed do what it says it's supposed to do. This will cost you a lot of money because this takes, believe me, this takes a lot of time. Or you could choose a tool which has been through this qualification method themselves within the company or even a tool which has been certified and qualified by an external company. So let's have a look at the comparison between the standards we've looked at so far. So we'll see the differences at the top, the IEC 61508 and ISO 26262. I've grouped these together because they're similar standards. They are both functional safety standards and for the automotive and electronic industry. These are both standards. They talk about both hardware and software. It's very prescriptive in the detail of what you would need to do and how you should think about how to comply to the recommendations and the requirements that they give. And tools can be certified for developing ISO 26262 and IEC 61508 projects. So you could purchase a tool which has been certified. For the DO178B and DO178C, these are guidelines or recommendations. It's purely for software. And they've given you a lot of flexibility in how you define the software lifecycle. So it can be open to interpretation. The tool vendors, they can create the, the qualification data, show you the requirements, show you all the test cases. And this needs to be done on a per project level. So if you use a software tool in your DO178B project, you would need to show that you've used the tool as recommended on a project level. So a tool itself can't be stamped with a certification for DO178B. It has to be used as part of the project that will be for the software being released into the aeroplane, say. But what do these standards and recommendations have in common? Well, they all appear, they all look at a risk-based approach. They all say that tools used must be certified or qualified. And they all advocate the use of coding standards. 